we're getting ready to start, so I'd ask uh, anybody who's still up at the reception to come on down and uh, get to your table. It's wonderful to see such a great crowd here in Pike. My name is Bill Weinberg, and I'm chairman of the East Kentucky Leadership Foundation. I want to welcome you to the 24th Annual East Kentucky Leadership Conference. We have an exciting program tonight and tomorrow, and we're glad that you can be a part of it. I'm going to ask uh, everyone, if they would now, to stand for the posting of the colors by the Pikeville College ROTC. Let us bow our heads, please. Our Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this day and the opportunity to be here to participate in this year's Leadership Conference. We thank Thee for our country. We're so thankful for this Commonwealth of Kentucky and especially for our Eastern Kentucky and the beauty of it. We call upon Thee to bless our country and our leaders and all who aspire to lead. Please bless this conference and all who are here. We thank thee for this food and ask thy blessings upon it. Please bless all who have a part in making all this possible for us. In Jesus' name, amen. And let me welcome you to this uh, Eastern Kentucky Leadership Conference. Several years ago, uh, a lot of the people from up here said, we need to, to get better acquainted with our neighbors. We need to have an opportunity to sit down and exchange ideas and, uh, and, and work together to bring about common solutions for Eastern Kentucky. And we, we, we in Eastern Kentucky don't have a dominant government. Uh, we're not like Lexington or Louisville where they lead the region. We have, we have a lot of people in many counties that have common and similar problems. And so uh, we have for, I think, about 24 years sponsored this conference. And, and I want to thank uh, the many businesses in the area that, uh, that helped us sponsor this conference because it's an opportunity for us to get together and exchange ideas. Uh, today, I understand we had a very good session on health care. I appreciate the people that participated in that. Tomorrow we're going to have about eight or nine different topics that we're going to discuss for an hour at a time for three different sessions. And so I encourage you to come out tomorrow, and, and, and these are not where you're going to be lectured to. It's where you're going to have an opportunity to have your input into the discussion of real problems that affect our people. I can, uh, I can tell you that over the years, Many ideas that have been generated at these conferences that have been put into practice uh, and, uh, and, in fact, uh, have made a difference. 
As Bill mentioned earlier, the, uh, the, the card uh, program that uh, we developed uh, and is now a reality uh, and being supported by uh, the governor's recommendation for an ARC grant, those are the kinds of things that come out of these discussions. So, uh, uh, as I say, we're not going to be lectured to tomorrow, but tonight we are going to have a message from our leader, Governor Bashir, and, uh, and, and again, I welcome him to our community of Eastern Kentucky, and particularly our community of Pikeville and Pike County. We're very honored to have all of you all here, and we're very honored to have the governor. Governor, I've sort of been there, done that, uh, as you well know, and uh, uh, we, we, you and I are very, very pleased with the opportunity to serve the people of Kentucky. And, and I will say, uh, times were a little bit fatter than they are now. Uh, you, have, you have led this state in, in the time of an unprecedented, unimaginable economic contraction that has, uh, that has left the state totally unable to, to meet uh, the many commitments that had been made. And so you have had to, to shepherd us through that area, uh, working with the legislator, and I appreciate the many members of the legislature that are here. Uh, all in all, I think you've done a good job. You've done a, you've done a good job. And you have protected what is important to, I think, the future of Kentucky, and that is education. And for that, I personally thank you and, 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 and the legislator. That is, that is our future. And we're making progress. Kentucky is making progress in the field of education. Uh, even, even while other states are regressing, we are still going forward because of the leadership that our guest tonight and his colleagues in the General Assembly have provided. So uh, you, you know Governor Bashir. You, he's been here many times. Uh, and uh, again, sir, we, we honor you. Uh, we thank you for honoring us with your presence tonight. I present to you the Governor of the Commonwealth, Steve Bashir. Governor. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's really my honor to be here at the East Kentucky Leadership Conference once again. And I'm especially honored to be introduced by one of the best governors that the Commonwealth of Kentucky has ever had. and one of the best First Ladies the Commonwealth of Kentucky has ever had. I apologize to you for being late, but Mother Nature has had me otherwise occupied for the last few days. It's been an interesting time since April the 22nd when this weather front started coming across Kentucky and has been pounding us with rain and wind and tornadoes. As you well know, we are facing and have been facing a crisis situation all across Kentucky with record rains and winds, the Ohio River and the Mississippi River for the first time in a long time are overflowing at the same time, and that is creating havoc all up and down both of those rivers. Monday, I declared a statewide state of emergency, which enabled and, uh, and loosened up all of our state agencies that work with our local officials during these crisis situations. We activated our emergency operations center in Frankfurt. And since that time, we have been in constant contact with local officials all across Kentucky. 
as we've all worked together to come through this current situation. I've activated the National Guard and we have several Guard men and women out working in various parts of Kentucky on security and on sandbagging and the like. I spent the day in western Kentucky, which is the hardest hit part of Kentucky overall because of the vicinity of the Ohio River and then where it flows and joins the Mississippi River down in far western Kentucky. And I must tell you that while it is devastating in many ways to see, and that is the widespread flooding, it is also heartening to see once again Kentuckians coming together and working hard together to pull everybody through this kind of situation. They're doing a fantastic job down there. Our folks are doing a fantastic job all over Kentucky. Kentuckians are coming together again, as we always do, to handle these kinds of crisis situations. At the moment, we've got 55 counties and 19 cities that have declared states of emergency. And that will probably go up some over the next few days. This morning, I officially requested of President Obama a presidential disaster declaration. It takes the state hitting just above $5 million in damages for us to qualify as a state. I thought once we hit $35 million that we were there. And now it also takes individual counties hitting uh, their particular levels. And our counties are in the process as they're also fighting uh, the, the waters and the wind uh, to compile those damage figures. And I feel very confident that we will get the presidential disaster declaration. That will allow the federal government and FEMA to come in and will open up federal purse strings to help our state and local governments, our other agencies, our small businesses, and individuals to deal with the aftermath of this flooding and these winds. This is going to go on for a little while, unfortunately, because they're expecting a little more rain sometime over the weekend. And so our rivers, probably the major rivers, the Mississippi and the Ohio, may not crest until toward the end of next week or even into the week after that. And so, and so we're going to have to stay on top of this, and we'll stay on top of it as we work our way through it. Unfortunately, I can tell you that we know how to do this, mainly because we've had to do this over and over again over the last three and a half years. This will be the ninth presidentially declared disaster in the Commonwealth of Kentucky during my three and a half years as governor. So in addition to dealing with the financial crisis that Governor Patton mentioned, which I think is by far the worst financial crisis any of us have ever lived through in our lifetime, we've also had to deal with these kinds of disasters. But deal with them we have. Uh, Kentucky has come through extremely well in terms of surviving these natural disasters and pulling together to pull our people through these natural disasters. And I want to tell you that we have also done extremely well in coming through this financial crisis that not only Kentucky has experienced, but this whole country and indeed this whole world has experienced over the last three and a half years. It's been a difficult time. I don't have to tell you that. Uh, those of you that are in business know that. Those of you that have been sitting around your kitchen table every night trying to figure out how to make sure that we pay the mortgage and we buy the food and we keep clothes on our backs and we keep our kids in school, you've been having to do the same thing. Well, we've done the same thing in state government during that time. And while it's been tough on us, every time I get, in, get to feeling sorry for myself, I just go to another state for a day. And then when I come home, I feel a lot better about the Commonwealth of Kentucky and how we've handled this crisis. Let me give you an example or two. You know, 
During our three and a half years here, and I know our legislators uh, can witness this, we have had to balance our budget now nine times in three and a half years because of the recession. We've had to rebalance it to keep it in balance. We've cut over a billion dollars in spending over that three and a half years out of our budget. We have right now the smallest workforce in the executive branch that we've had in 20 years. Not because we've had any massive layoffs, but because as folks leave, as they go to another job, as they retire, we've just not filled that spot. And we've continued to shrink government and ask people to do more. And they have done more. I'm very proud of our state employees. They've stepped up during this tough time. They haven't gotten any raises. We've had to do some furloughs that, uh, that they have taken, unpaid days. But they have stepped up and continued and actually improved the delivery of services to the people in this commonwealth. And, and I'm proud of that. I'm proud of, of our workforce. When I saw what was coming three and a half years ago, shortly after I came into office, when I saw this financial crisis hitting us full in the face, I, I set two goals. One was a very simple goal, and that is to do everything we could to get our people through this, to come out on the other side of this financial crisis in one piece. And it's been a tough one. The other goal I set was to not allow us to go backward in major areas, but instead to move forward, to continue making progress. And folks, we've done both of those. And let me tell you just a little bit about a subject that Governor Patton mentioned that is so dear to all of us, and that is the education of our children. While other states, such as New Jersey, are balancing their budget by laying off 3,000 teachers. States like North Carolina and Georgia and Colorado and many others are balancing their budget by cutting millions and millions and millions of dollars out of the K-12 through budget in their states. Illinois is balancing its budget in another way. It just raised the personal income tax rate 66% and raise the business tax rate 45%. We've done none of that. We've had no broad-based tax increases, and the legislature and I got together and we said, when we make these spending cuts, we're not gonna do it across the board. We're not gonna take a meat ax approach, because while everything that state government does is important to somebody, there are a few things that state government does that are more important to most of us than the other things. And so we set the education of our children as the top priority in this state, and we said no matter what we do to anything else, we want to hold that together. We want to hold that educational infrastructure together. And we've done it. And nine times we've done it. And I'm proud of that. And Rocky, I know that you all in the legislature are proud of it too. Because by doing that, by doing that, as we start coming out of this recession, and we are, it's going to be a slow climb, but we're turning the corner in this state. And we're going to come out of this recession a lot faster and a lot better off than most of these other states because we have not damaged our basic infrastructure. We've held that educational infrastructure together. We've continued to create jobs and work for our people. And because of that, we're gonna come out of this thing fine. It's tough, it's still tough. But my friends, you watch us. Over the next 18 months to two years, you're gonna see this state on a climb that's gonna be a lot faster than most of our neighbors. And our folks are going to come out of this a lot better than most of our neighbors. You know, we worked hard to get our people through this. And, but as I mentioned, that long-term goal was to not only keep our infrastructure together, but to move us forward. And there are really two or three areas that we've concentrated on. Obviously, one of the top areas can be summed up in a single word. And that word is a job. 
There's nothing more important to anybody in this state right now than a good paying job. That's what people want because they want to support their families. They want their family to have as good, if not a better quality of life than what they've had. And it's been tough. But I'll tell you what we did that has made a huge difference in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. About 20 months ago, we had a special session. We sat down with the legislature and we decided to totally revise all of our economic incentive programs in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Up until that time, we had a lot of tools to work with a company from some other state or some other country and cause them to make a decision to come into the state and bring new jobs. But we had no tools to sit down and work with our good Kentucky businesses that were already here. Folks that had been here a while, folks that wanted to expand and to grow and to create new jobs. We had nothing that we could help them with. And so we totally revised all of our toolbox in economic development and gave ourselves that flexibility. And folks, that strategy is working. And it's working in a very significant and accelerating way. Just in the last 20 months, over 280 companies have been preliminarily approved for one or more of those new or expanded economic development programs. Those 280 companies represent a new investment, a new capital investment in the Commonwealth of Kentucky of over $2.5 billion. They represent over 17,000 new jobs and over 5,100 what I would call retained jobs, jobs that would have moved out of Kentucky if we had not had the tools to sit down and keep that company right here at home. Now, as I say, we're not out of this yet, and we all know it, but because of that kind of hard work that the legislature and I put in, and using those tools now over the last 20 months, we are moving in the right direction. And that's one of the main reasons I tell you we're going to come out of this a lot faster and a lot stronger than most other states because we're able to attract and to grow not only new business from out of state but our own Kentucky business. I'm excited about that. One of the other areas in addition to education that I've already mentioned and I've mentioned what we've done there is health care. The health care of our people. And I could talk to you for several minutes about the different programs we have, and I'm not going to, most of you know some of them. The new dental care program, which is a pilot program right here in eastern Kentucky. You know, we don't have any new money yet, although we're starting now to, our revenues are starting to pick up, and hopefully over the next couple of years, as we put together our next budget, we'll be able to tackle some new programs in the area of health care and in the area of education. But we don't, didn't have new money at the moment, but I, it was absolutely essential that we start addressing dental care in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. That's one of the biggest problem areas we've got, not only here in eastern Kentucky, but all over Kentucky. But a good thing happened. We've got something called the Appalachian Regional Commission that we've worked with for years. Governor Patton was chair of that, the state co-chair. Well, it so happened that I convinced my fellow governors in the Appalachian region to allow me to be the co-chair this year. And you know it's always good to have a seat at the table. It's even better to have a seat at the head of the table. And as Governor Patton can tell you, when you are in that state co-chair position, uh, you can be not only an equal to the other states, but maybe a little bit of a first among equal for the year that you're there. And so we got some ARC grants and we put together a dental program that is training our dentists to handle more pediatric dental care because if we need to get to our young children, we need to get to them early and to teach them proper dental care and to take care of their teeth and their, and their mouth so that as they start growing up and they get into school, they've already got good habits and they're well on their way to being healthy adults. We also found when I came into office 
that the KCHIP program and the Medicaid program covering health insurance for children in low-income families was covering about 50 or 60,000 children in the state, and that was good. The bad news is, is that they projected that we had about another 60,000 kids that were eligible for those programs, but weren't in it for some reason. And so we set out on an aggressive program to find those kids and to get them in the KCHIP and Medicaid program so that they could have health insurance. And I'm proud to tell you here today that over the last 18 months or so, we have enrolled 52,000 more children in the KCHIP program. That's 52,000 more kids who, because of that, are going to have a much better chance, a much better chance to grow up and be productive adults. Every teacher in your kindergarten and elementary schools will tell you, a child that is sick, a child's got a toothache, a child that's not feeling good is not going to learn. And if that's a chronic condition, then they're going to fall behind their peers. And when they fall behind, many of them never catch up. So again, a healthy start in life is so extremely important to a successful life. And we've been concentrating in these first three and a half years on trying to make sure that more of our children all across this state get that healthy start in life. You know, when it comes to economic development, we're not only working with our existing businesses to expand and to grow, but we also set out in Eastern Kentucky on an export initiative, identifying companies here in Eastern Kentucky who could benefit by learning how to expand their markets. Once again, we got an ARC grant, and with that grant, we are putting on seminars and programs to educate our small and medium-sized businesses right here in Eastern Kentucky on what new markets are all about, on where they are, on how you reach them, and on how you handle them. And that is beginning to work. We have three companies already signed up to meet a Mexican lumber buyers delegation in May. We've got two companies, actually we've got eight Eastern Kentucky companies that will be attending two international trade shows in China this fall. A furniture manufacturing and supply show and a coal and mining expo. In all, we have held 18 seminars in communities throughout Eastern Kentucky on starting or expanding a small business and on exporting and finding new markets for your products. So this is working. It's working. And you know, there's no easy answer to building your economy. It is company by company, and it's step by step. And that's the way we're doing this. And all these efforts are paying off in other ways. We've got companies like Kentucky Hydrocarbon and Republic Diesel in Floyd County now, Johnson Industries in Pike County, Ferris Corporation over in Letcher County, CSC in Knox County, and many more to come. In all, I believe since we revised all of those economic incentive packages, we have made 40 announcements in Eastern Kentucky, either new business locations or the expansion of existing businesses. Collectively, those announcements represent an investment of almost $112 million in Eastern Kentucky, with the creation of more than 780 new jobs and the retention of many other jobs. That is just the start, and we've got to keep at this. As you know, one of the things that we felt very strongly about was locating a person representing the governor of this commonwealth right out of the governor's office in eastern Kentucky to work to bring business to Eastern Kentucky and to sell Eastern Kentucky to business. And I found, I think, the right person for the job, Ben Hale. Ben is here. Ben, where are you? Stand up, Ben. Let's give Ben a round of applause. Ben is working full time 
with our state agencies, our federal agencies, with the industrial authorities, with local county officials, with folks throughout eastern Kentucky as we continue to find ways to build this economy. Now, something that we all know, but that I want to say to you very loudly and very clearly, is that the coal industry is the foundation of a lot of this economy in eastern Kentucky. And folks, it's going to continue to be the foundation of this economy in eastern Kentucky. Coal provides over 90% of our electricity in the Commonwealth. It provides over 50% of the electricity for the entire United States of America. And so it's not going away anytime soon. It is going to be with us for years and years to come. Now, we have challenges to face, and we need to stand up and face them, and that's what we're doing. We've got to constantly push for cleaner ways to burn coal because we're under pressures in that area. And those technologies are out there. And if we are given the time, those technologies will develop to where we will be able to burn coal much cleaner than we can today. And folks, we'll develop those technologies. And this country will continue to be great because it'll continue to get so much of its industry from our natural resource that we are so proud of here in Eastern Kentucky, and that is the mining of coal. One other issue I want to mention to you, because it's an issue that has been in the news here recently, but it's an issue that is not new to us, and that is prescription drug abuse. What used to be called a problem in Kentucky is now an epidemic. It is an epidemic. We have, on the average, 82 people a month dying from overdoses. Folks, that's more people in a month dying from overdoses than dying from car wrecks. That's an epidemic. Now, we in Kentucky have been attacking that problem and, and, and have developed tools that are very effective in tackling that problem. Our law enforcement people, our educational people, our treatment people, and our monitoring program for prescription drugs. When we put our monitoring program together, I believe about 10 years ago, by 2006, Kentucky's monitoring program for prescription drugs was touted by the White House as the best in the country. We're at the top of the heap when it comes to monitoring the sale and for, of, of prescription drugs. The problem is we're not an island. While there are 34 other states that have similar, similar monitoring programs, that leaves still a number of states who don't. And we all know what's been going on. The state of Florida has not had a monitoring program. And because of that, the folks that want to abuse our system, the folks that want to sell prescription drugs illegally and continue to destroy our families, jump on the plane and get a $99 round trip ticket or jump in their car and they go to Florida. Folks, over the last five years, the number of pill mills in Florida has grown from something like three or four to over 100. 98 of the top 100 prescribers of OxyContin are in the state of Florida. That tells you something. The state police tell me that on average, the person who goes down and buys these pills and brings them back to sell here in Kentucky brings back an average of $10,000 worth of pills each trip. I don't have to tell you what this is doing to our people. I don't have to tell you what it's doing to our families. We've got to put a stop to it. We. Florida, last year, finally passed a monitoring system. And we were excited about that because I'm going to tell you, there is no tool that will cut off that Florida pipeline faster than that. But they elected a new governor, Governor Scott, who came in and announced that 
He was concerned about patient privacy and therefore was not going to fund that program. I went up in February to Washington, D.C. for the first time after he came in as governor and I sought him out and I asked him to sit down and we did and I talked through this with him. And he still was not convinced. He still had these privacy concerns and quite honestly, you know, I said, what is the concern? He said, well, West, or I think it was Virginia, two years ago, their system was hacked into and people's medical records were taken. And I said, you know, there is no, there is no computer system in the world that I'm sure somebody can hack into, including the CIAs and the defense departments or anybody else. But when you get right down to it, we in Kentucky are having 82 people a month dying from overdoses. You in Florida are having seven people a day dying from overdoses. And I'm going to tell you something, to heck with this privacy stuff. The lives of our people are a lot more important than the slight possibility of somebody hacking into a system. I had the federal drug czar talk to him. Other governors talked to him. But we still had not convinced him. Then I got a call from a congressional committee that wanted Governor Scott and myself to go testify in Washington, D.C. on this problem. And I said, yes, I will. I'll be there. He, he said he would be there. And we came up, and I'm sure the folks on that committee were ready for a food fight. They were going to get more than a food fight from me, I can tell you that. But about five minutes before we went into that hearing room, Governor Scott came in and he said, I've decided I'm going to implement that monitoring system. And so instead of a food fight, we had a love in at that committee meeting. And I want to tell you, it wasn't just me who caused that. Congressman Hal Rogers, who has been at the forefront in fighting this drug problem had made it a big issue. And I'll tell you, anytime you got a guy who has the purse strings in Washington in the House, that's going to make a difference to a governor of Florida or any place else. Lieutenant Governor Daniel Manjardo has been right on this from the very beginning. Attorney General Jack Conway had been in discussions with their attorney general down there, had written op-ed editorials in the Florida papers urging the governor to change his mind. And so it was a concerted effort. And I'm glad to say that now they're going to implement that system. That doesn't mean we've solved the problem. Because when we cut off this pipeline, there are still several states who don't have this program. But I was also happy about 10 days later that the, that the federal government, the Obama administration, came out through its Drug Control Policy Office and they are going to push getting this monitoring program in every other state in the union. And I think that's a great idea because once we have it everywhere, and then once we can share that information, which we are now working a system to do with Ohio, and then we're going to do it with the rest of the states, we will make a huge dent in this problem that plagues all of Kentucky and is destroying our families. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got a unique place here called Eastern you know, a lot of our strategies work anywhere, but there are some places that are special and you need to address specially in unique ways, and Eastern Kentucky is one of them. We've got unique opportunities here, and we've got some unique challenges here. One of the biggest challenges we have is just the infrastructure system, the road system. What a, what a wonderful bit of progress we've made through the years, particularly when Governor Patton was in office. I mean, you can't even compare the roads of today here with the roads of yesteryear. But we're still not there. We've still got plenty of work to do. But all in all, the opportunities here so far outweigh the challenges. And it's our challenge to continue to work together to take these programs that we've started, to take other new ideas that you have, to work with the Ben Hales of this world, to come together and to make sure that more and more Eastern Kentuckians
get to share in that American dream. Because that is really what life is all about, is making sure that our people here in Eastern Kentucky and in, indeed all over Kentucky share that American dream. And not only do they share it, but their children get to share it likewise. Thank you all very much for having me. Thank you, everyone, and good evening. Welcome to the East Kentucky Expo Center in Pikeville. I'm Steve Hensley with WYMT. Hey, and I'm Bill Fraley. We want to welcome you and thank you for attending the 24th Annual East Kentucky Leadership Conference and tonight's awards dinner. Tonight, we will pay tribute to those who have spent their lives serving others. For the last 24 years, the East Kentucky Leadership Foundation has recognized those people and organizations that have worked to make our mountain region a better place for all of us to live. Our first award tonight is for the cultural arts. It was in 2002 when the Artist Collaborative Theater opened its doors in Elkhorn City for its very first production. Now, years later, the theater is booming, spanning counties and state lines. This year, the theater is being honored with the East Kentucky Leadership Award for Cultural Arts. The arts are not a luxury. The arts are a necessity in life. And we are so blessed to live in a community with supporters and leaders, public officials, Pike County Physical Court, Representative W. Keith Hall, Representative Holmes, Senator Jones, and Representative Collins, who believe, and, who believe in and support the arts in our community. Artist Collaborative Theater volunteers work tirelessly. There are no words to describe how hard they work to put on the eight productions a year and 16 performances of each production. But the, the play is just the icing on the cake. And this is our mission, that what we take away from the production, the self-confidence, the pride, the love, the compassion for each other, sort of just like components of leadership, that's, that's what we work toward. I am humble and I represent many, many volunteers I'm just the face, but the backbone are our volunteers, our board of directors, and our people who make it possible. Thank you all so much. Many of you, especially around here, are familiar with the Appalachian News Express. It comes to newsstands and homes across the region. The Pike County newspaper reports and examines news, government, sports, and the lighter side. The Appalachian News Express is the recipient of the East Kentucky Leadership Award for Media this year. I've been told I have a uh, face for radio and a voice for newspaper, and after seeing that clip, I know why. I uh, usually let Jerry speak because he's very good at this kind of stuff, and I shake hands up for people coming up here because uh, I, I recognize you, I appreciate you. I want to say thank you very much for this award. It's fabulous. Uh, Jerry Boggs, our editor, come on up here, uh, does a great job for us. Our News Express employees, y'all stand up, please. I want, to, I want to salute you. I want to thank you all for what you do. I want to thank you all for recognizing us. I want to thank my wife for putting up with me. And Jerry, you got a word or something to say? Thank you very much. And we usually let him talk because most of the folks understand his dialect. I'm from that state of New Jersey that the governor rec recognized before. So thank you very much once again. We appreciate every one of you, and I appreciate the employees. And uh, I am just the face behind the hardworking people. Thank you very much. All right, our next award is for the MESED organization, which stands for Mountain Association for Community Economic Development. 
The organization is based in Berea, but serves all of Eastern Kentucky. In its more than 30 year history, it has helped countless businesses flourish in the region. Thank you very much. Um, I want to appreciate the um, foundation and the conference and for this uh, award. We're extremely proud and pleased to be honored this way. Um, we sure believe that entrepreneurship and small businesses are uh, the economic engine that makes Eastern um, Kentucky um, go and uh, are proud to be part of with lots of others' work uh, to, um, to grow that key part of our economy. In particular, I want to recognize our staff in our um, Paintful office, and Regina and Yvonne. Y'all um, do an incredible job. And I'm pleased to announce we just opened up an office in Hazard as, a, as of um, yesterday. So um, thank you all. Appreciate it. You know, in the past few years, the city of Pikeville has grown in many ways. Behind the scenes is city manager Donovan Blackburn, who strives to build the region's economy and create new opportunities. Blackburn is being honored tonight for his work with the East Kentucky Leadership Award for a public individual. Thank you. I'm so very grateful and extremely humbled to have been selected for such a great honor. There's nothing more gratifying than to have been acknowledged for the job well done as a public servant by those whom you serve. I graciously accept this honor, but not in my name, alone, but the name of the wonderful community with the pride, hands of hard work, and relentless drive has made this city into what it is today, and therefore why I am so proud to serve and call Eastern Kentucky my home. God is great. He has blessed me with not only this wonderful community and opportunity, but with wonderful friends, a great family, good health, and a job that I dearly love. I want to thank the mayor and the city commissioners for believing in me seven years ago and allow me to be part of something that's very special. I've always, I always want to recognize the men and women who serve beside me, providing services that protect and add great value to the quality of life for all of Eastern Kentucky. I thank the board and the host committee of East Kentucky leadership for their hard work and this great honor and for also selecting Pikeville for this year's conference. I appreciate Governor Patton's participation as a board member with this great organization and for this year's host committee. Last and certainly not least, I want to offer, also want to recognize my two sons who see, are sitting here tonight, Tristan and Jeremy Blackburn, who are sitting, who hopefully, who, who have also contributed to their community by be, the ways that they were brought up, by being respectful and hardworking service to the community, and they have made me extremely proud. I want to also take a moment to thank my lovely wife, who's the love of my wife. She's, she's my rock and my foundation of our family. She's my biggest supporter and fan, and without her, I would certainly not be standing before you tonight. Again, thank you, everyone, for their support in this great region that I'm so deeply honored to serve. Thank you. Our next award is for private individual, or in this case, individuals with an S. Bill Francis is a Kentucky Wildcat through and through, but more importantly to him, he's a proud Eastern Kentucky native. He met his wife Linda in college, and since moving to Prestonsburg in 1974, their impact in the education and arts communities has been tremendous. Thank you. I'm very appreciative of this award and humbled by it. Thanks. She is the wing, the wind beneath my wings, and we appreciate the opportunity to serve East Kentucky. We've been at it for 37 years, and uh, it's a very humbling experience to receive this, and it's also a nice honor. We thank you very much. Well, our final award is a very special one. Jill and I both had the pleasure of working for the man the award is named after. The winner of the Tony Turner Award is 83 years old today and has no plans to retire. 
He has no plans to retire or stop drag racing. Yes, drag racing. The owner of Kinzer Drilling in Floyd County has certainly lived the American dream. But Willard Kinzer's generosity is why he is one of this year's Leadership Award winners. I feel deeply honored to accept this award. I'm not much at making a speech, so <clears throat> I guess I'll just say thank everybody, and from the bottom of my heart, I am humbled to accept this award. Thank you. We certainly hope you've enjoyed our program tonight, and we also want to encourage you to get involved in your communities to make a difference. We certainly also want to thank the wonderful people here at the Expo Center, the city of Pikeville, and everyone involved in this year's East Kentucky Leadership Awards. And of course, we also want to thank our fantastic audience and all of those watching on TV and on the web. We hope you've had a great evening, and we hope to see you again next year. Have a safe trip home, everyone. Good night. Good night.